I thought it was very in, uh, important to focus on the history here. And I think there's some things that have been forgotten when the courts look at these questions. <coughs> so here we go. Courts have overlooked Abraham Lincoln's Libra Code and why that made the Holocaust different from scenarios like uh, the ones that Bill Perlstein will talk about involving antiquities. The cases are different factually, legally, and historically. Uh, the courts have really overlooked the London Declaration, which teaches us that a main victory, an allied objective in World War II was to undo duress sales. We won the war. It was and is our policy to undo these duress sales. And the courts have not faithfully applied that. Courts have also overlooked New York's Holzer versus Reichsbahn. And that's a, a story that, that I'll tell about a 1936 case in which New York courts rejected terrible acts of Nazism. And that was years before the United States entered World War II. And also, there's a case called Bernstein with a complicated name in which uh, the courts were freed of the limitation of the act of sovereign doctrine uh, from undoing the acts of Nazism and, and were given a green light by the US government. And the result of the inattention to the history of this, I believe, has undermined the US victory in World War II. We won, we fought, we bled to undo what Hitler and his henchmen did. And I challenge the courts to remember that victory and the price. So here's a couple of cases that come out that seem to be in conflict. Kassir versus King of Spain. Spain gets Nazi looted art by the doctrine of acquisitive prescription. Okay, remember that one? Uh, it's a civil law doctrine that is, is akin to um, uh, wrongful uh, uh, adverse possession of a chattel. Um, and then uh, we have uh, the opposite result where in Bakalev versus Vavra, uh, the, the court applies New York law for an artwork in that jurisdiction. So I would submit that cases like these are, are problematic, they're in tension, and will ultimately need to be resolved somehow. But let's go back to first principles, the Lieber Code. Abraham Lincoln asked Francis, Francis Lieber, who was a professor at Columbia and a former Russian military, Prussian uh, military officer, to put together a, a code of war. And that code of war is called the Lieber Code Executive Order 100, and it entered into our law and military law and was in place in the United States until the early 20th century. And what did it say? You can't seize property of the enemy. The spoils of war doctrine is basically gone and it applies to artworks. And the US signed the Hague Convention in 1907, which made that international law. And Germany was a signatory to the Hague Convention. So when we enter the 20th century, there is international law, and it says you can't steal works of art. So Hitler is different from those leaders who had looted previously in history. And how do we know the Nazis were the bad guys? They said so in their platform. They said that nationals can only be citizens of the, uh, 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 citizens of the state. They went after Jews and to destroy the art and culture that they represented. And history's greatest murder until today has hidden history's greatest property crime. We can look at the military images, but that doesn't show us how things were taken from Jewish people. Most of it was in seemingly peaceable activities. So 9% of the Nazi total government budget was stolen from Jews. And here's what the London Declaration said. This was our declaration of what we were going to achieve in World War II and is still today our foreign policy. And the punchline is that we uh, committed to undo acts of Nazi spoliation that were seemingly voluntary transactions. Now, how do we know that we knew all about this Nazi looted art, uh, art looting 
from the post-war period until today. Well, we can look at Milton Estro's article above the fold in November 1964, and Milton's here in the audience tonight, um, and he says between 1945 and 1962, almost 4,000 stolen art objects were recovered in this country by the U.S. State Department uh, with the assistance of other countries. So the public knew that Europe was trying to recover these artworks. It was on the front page of the New York Times. All these stories you hear about good faith purchasers who were so innocent, who got all these works that came out of war-torn Europe, it just simply doesn't make historical sense. Of course they knew. And of course we don't care in New York because we have no good faith purchaser defense. If there's a thief in the chain of title, no one takes good title. Um, and this Hague Convention has long been part of our foreign policy, and here's the Holocaust Rit Victims Redress Act of 1998, which s cites that. Uh, museum directors have testified to Congress that, oh no, they don't need to be regulated because they will undertake all this research, they will give it back. No, Congress, you don't need to pass laws to let property vi uh, victims recover property because state law will let you recover. That's what they argued to Congress in 1998 and here in 2006 is a quotation from the head of the American Association of Museum Directors. Yet those same museums went to court and asserted jurisdiction and statute of limitations and cut off the rights of Jewish victims to reclaim their property. How do you prove the Holocaust? How do you prove this stuff happened? Well, uh, Judge Walker made uh, reference to the duress. Let's look at the, the, uh, uh, the James McDonald letter of resignation, December 27, 1935. He discusses how on April 1st, 1933, the Nazis put a boycott on Jews, an economic boycott so harsh that Jews could not buy food or medicine in parts of Germany. So this duress concept that it was a generalized thing is just simply not borne out by a close look at what happened in historical facts. Jewish property declarations, there's almost no scholarship of this. And this is in 1938, uh, April 27, 1938 law, Jews were required to put, register their property. If you had over more than 5,000 Reichs marks, it was various categories. And the law, it said that all of this property will be available to Field Marshal Goering for implementation of the four-year plan. These declarations were filed every four months until the Jews had left the, uh, left the, uh, the Reich. The Holzer versus Reichsbound case, uh, that's a 1936 case uh, in New York where Marcel Holzer was an employee of the Deutsche Reichsbahn. Uh, they fire him because he's Jewish. They put him in a concentration camp. The, the Nazis put him in a concentration camp for six months. He gets back to New York and he sues. And the New York County judge lets him attach the office furniture of the, the, the Deutsche Reichsbahn. Uh, and the Nazi consul general comes in and said, there's sovereign immunity for that. And the, the judge said, well, sovereign immunity is a tribal issue. So this goes all the way up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals says, uh, we're gonna have a trial on this, on, the, on that issue. So 1936, five years before the United States enters World War II. And what are some of the things that we find in this case? Uh, and it's a very complicated case to read because there's a bunch of decisions that uh, you have to cross-reference and go back and forth. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's analogized to marriage and divorce cases, legitimacy of children, civil status. Are we, we New York going to recognize these Nazi laws that are so repugnant to our policy? Um, and the punchline is the judge says, I do not view comedy as a sort of chloroform which drugs our senses during the op operation admitted by the Reichsbahn. Uh, and goes on to talk about public policy. Uh, the other case that I wanted to draw to your attention is the Bernstein case. And the Second Circuit held that, well, uh, this act that happened to a, a Jewish man, a, con a, a contract, uh, uh, he was fired because he was Jewish or his property was taken. Um, the Second Circuit said, well, it was the acts of a foreign sovereign 
new district court may not review that act. Uh, the State Department wrote a letter, Jack Tate wrote a letter to the Southern District of New York and said the U.S. State Department wants to relieve the courts of this nation from all jurisdiction, uh, all jurisdictional restraints in undoing the acts of the Nazis. And that Bernstein case, I submit, uh, should really illuminate the, the work of jurists in understanding these cases. Thank you.